product of California. When the Endangered Species Act hit and they cut off water to Joaquin, I think it's the Joaquin Valley, in, in California, it dried up some of the very best growing land in the entire country, if not parts of the world. Now, a lot of us believe that that was done purposely because if you look at this as a layer cake, and as we go along, we do this a little more depthly, you will maybe start seeing how one thing fits onto another and builds to another and builds to another, and how they're all interconnected to achieve their goal. When I use words like there and they, I'm talking about those that want to control us, statists that believe that they know better than we do, and environmental extremists that absolutely tack on to all of this stuff to get their agenda across. So when I say they and them, that's mostly who I'm talking about. So, and with Nixon signing this, I want you to know that all of this environmentalist movement has nothing to do with Republican or Democrat. It has to do with right and wrong. The uh, far left is absolutely pushing it. But like I heard a, uh, a, a representative in, in, uh, up at the Capitol say this year, we were talking about Medicaid expansion. She said, well, we're not really going to, this is Republican, we're not really going to you know, expand Medicaid, but we're coming up with something different just so that people know we care. Yeah. <clears throat> really? So anyhow, uh, this is how a lot of Republicans, I think, get trapped in this. Because let's be honest, saving the bald eagle was kind of cool, wasn't it? Maybe? Yeah. Maybe not. I believe that we can wipe out as many, well, maybe not as many, but we have dominion over the world, don't we? As humans, we have dominion over what's going on here. But, um, so we save some of the things. Sometimes we get uh, uh, some good results, sometimes some bad results, I suppose. Fortunately, they are looking over the Endangered Species Act right now and looking at how it's, how it's uh, uh, impacting different economic things that can be done, and they're going to, I hope, change some of that. Um, so also in 1972, we have the Environmental Protection Treaty between the United States and Russia. Of course, the USSR was no longer in existence, so it had to be all renegotiated in 1994 while Bill Clinton was in office. And this is where they came up with the World Heritage Treaty. Have we heard of Ozark Man in the Biosphere? Who's heard of that? Nope, a couple of wanting to you. Okay, that was uh, something long ago that was fought. How about uh, Ozark, uh, what was it, Ozark National Heritage? Now, you've seen that in some signs around here, but there was supposed to be a congressional designation that would have designated many, many counties in southern Missouri as a, as a uh, national heritage site. And if that would have occurred, thank God we fought that off, if that would have occur occurred, have you ever heard that when they say the United Nations owns our parks? Has anybody heard that said? The United Nations doesn't own our parks. Not to my knowledge, if I found that. Work. But what they do is they can control things within our parks through these treaties. So if the Ozarks would have been designated a heritage treaty, the UN would have absolutely been able to have say as to what was going on down there. Yeah. And since 1972, 68% of all U.S. parks, monuments, and reserves have been designated heritage areas. In 1995, this is why it's important, 1995, the Crown Butte Mines wanted to do some mining just outside of Yosemite National Park. It was three miles away from the border of the park. There were some environmentalist groups that tried to get it to stop, but since this Crown Butte Mines went through all the different hoops they had to go through, got the, got the required permits and all these other different things and did the studies they were supposed to do, the government wasn't going to stop them. So what did the environmentalist movement did? They went to the United Nations and they started invoking the Heritage, World Heritage Treaty. And as a matter of fact, when the United Nations found out about this going on, three miles from Yosemite, it declared that the Yosemite National Park was a World Heritage Site in danger. When they made that declaration, the federal government then stopped in and told the Crown Butte Mines they could do nothing and they had to pull out completely. That is why it's very important that you know how these things work and why it's a problem that these sorts of organizations are, that these treaties and that the UN can get it involved themselves. Because it does impact us. Who put all this spending stuff on uh, Stockholm Conference of 72 is the next step in this process, the UN Earth Summit number one. Also known as the Conference on Human Environment, led by Maurice Strong. He was their Secretary General. We're going to talk about Maurice Strong as we go along. I think there's two people we're going to talk about in here primarily. There's a few, but Maurice Strong is one of the biggest movers and shakers in the environmentalist movement throughout the entire world. Period. I, I recommend that you would contact him a little bit. It's my understanding that Russia has a hit on him, and he's currently living in China. 
Um, he, he's he's uh, got family ties in China, and if you read some, there's a book called The Rise of Global Governance. If you read that book, it'll tell you an awful lot more, and that's by Henry Lamb. Uh, it'll tell you a whole lot more about Maurice Strong. Uh, but this, he was the Secretary General here. This is where non-government organizations started really getting to be a, be a, a big hold. Uh, that's your Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, Ducks Unlimited, the Wild Turkey Federation. Those are all known as non-government organizations because they work very closely with governments and they operate an awful lot like the government does. Uh, this is where environmental issues first hit the mainstream. They created the United Nations Environment Program, also known as UNEP, and there are 26 principles and 109 recommendations. I don't get into a whole lot of those because things continue to change. I told you this was like a layer cake, and it's a multi-layered cake. They'll come up with one plan early on, they'll have another committee meeting and come up with some more plans, and they'll add to it, and build to it, build to it. Uh, this is what Maurice Strong said in 1992. He said, it is clear that current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake, consumption of large amounts of frozen and convenience foods, use of fossil fuels, appliances, home and workplace air conditioning and suburban housing. I want to stop for just a minute right there. When he says affluent middle class, who is he talking about? He's a Canadian, by the way. Think of the world. How many high affluent middle classes are there in, are there in the country, in this world? Half dozen countries. Mostly America, primarily America. But maybe in England there's some middle class in Germany. So, so let, how about involving high meat intake? That could be them too. How about consumption of large amounts of frozen and convenient foods? That's the United States, period. He can, he can say he's talking about somebody else. But if you look what it said, and our use of fossil fuels are like nobody else in the world. Our appliances, home, our workplace air conditioning. Those of you who raised your hands earlier when you were in Europe, did you see any air conditioning? No. no. I didn't either. They don't use air conditioning. You can't even get ice. You couldn't hardly even get ice. That's absolutely correct. Um, so he is talking about and suburban housing. He is talking about America, period, when he says that all of these things that we do are not sustainable. A shift is necessary toward lifestyles less geared to environmentally damaging consumption patterns. A lifestyle geared. And a shift is necessary. Right. So that's Maurice Strong. We then get into Habitat One. This was the Conference on Human, he uh, human uh, Settlements, held in Vancouver, Canada. There are 64 recommendations for national action. It was also known as the Vancouver Action Plan. So these folks have been trying to get these things going along for quite some time. We're not going to go into the Vancouver Action Plan, but we're going to talk about one part of it, and it's called Part D Land. And I want you to pay very, very close attention to this, please. I put these things up here because if you don't understand the mentality of the people that put these different plans together, you won't truly understand their purpose. But once you read things like this, I believe you will. Land, because of its unique nature and the crucial role it plays in human settlements, cannot be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership was also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice. If unchecked, it may become a major obstacle in the planning and implementation of development schemes. Yeah. Social justice, urban renewal, and development, the provision of decent dwellings and healthy conditions for the people can only be achieved if land is used in the interest of society as a whole. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 1976. These individuals that put this together, that came together in Vancouver, Canada, already had the idea of taking your land away. Absolutely. This right here will tell you that they have no concern for private property issues. This is the exact process that these folks use throughout all of Sustainable Development, Agenda 21, and virtually most of what's happening in America today. And I'll show you that as we go down the road. Um, I want you to look at a couple of buzzwords here. Social injustice. Social justice. Now folks, again, you're just hearing some of these words now for the last few years you've heard social justice. 1976. These people have been designing this for that long. And they're working very they're working harder than you are. 
They're working harder than I would bet just about anybody in this room to advance their agenda over what us over us advancing our agenda. More efficiently, mm -hmm. too. And they're doing it more efficiently. With our and, tax dollars. And they're using our tax dollars. It does get worse. Um, so <laughs> this is the way they think. We then come along to the Brooklyn Commission, and this is one of the fun ones. Known as the World Commission on Environment and Development, it was convened in 1983. This is where the term sustainable development was first introduced for it during the Brooklyn Commission report known as Our Common Future. It's named the Brooklyn Commission because it was chaired by an individual by the name of Drew Harlan Brooklyn. This is another individual where you need to know who it is because this person has a great influence on everything that happens here in America today. Uh, she is currently, or was, the chair of the World Health Organization. She may still be, I don't, I don't recall. But let's look at Gru just a little bit here. She was the former Prime Minister of Norway. She is the Norwegian, Norwegian Labor Party member. When you hear Labor Party, what do you think of? Union. Unions, England, Europe. In Europe, a Labor Party is a socialist party, period. Yes. She was also a member of the Norwegian Humanist Association, and she was the first vice president of Socialist International. Now, Socialist International concerns me enough because socialists are certainly godless. Labor Party, being a socialist Marxist organization, they certainly are godless. But I want you to look at this right here. She is a member of the Norwegian Humanist Association. She believes in the Norwegian Humanist Association very, very frankly, as a matter of fact. And those of us in this room that call ourselves by his name, cannot possibly engage in the Humanist Association. Because these individuals are taking the step away from God being the creator and everything being God-centered to being humans being the creation, and are the created, and the uh, highest form here on earth, and the highest authority, and also are in charge of absolutely everything, our destiny and the whole nine yards. So we made it, we screw it up, we can fix it, is kind of their philosophy. And they believe that humans are, are uh, uh, although they're the top of the, they're the top of what the problem is here in the world. They're not necessarily uh, all that human, as it were. Only some of them. Yeah, only some of them, right? All right. So we move on to the big wave here, the Earth Summit Two, known as the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, or UNSAID, 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. It's also known as the Rio Conference. Again, Rory Strong is the conference secretary general. That quote earlier that we looked at where he said about the meat intake and high consumption. Well, this is where he said it was at this conference in 1992. There were over 178 nations. It was the largest, the largest uh, meeting of uh, nations, uh, representatives of nations ever that, uh, that I can find anywhere that's been recorded. 178 nations were there, representatives of. And George H.W. Bush, uh, signed the documents that came out of there, and Al Gore led the American delegation at this time. This is 1992. What came out of that was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This, I believe, and we'll talk about maybe some more a little bit later, we, are you all familiar with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? Very, very, very serious problems here, folks. The climate change people, I believe, this right here is their driver. If Agenda 21 is the blueprint, Climate change is the driver. They're using the climate change scare tactics to drive virtually everything that they're doing. Uh, this is where we come up with Agenda 21, Sustainable Development. And for anybody that wants to tell you that Agenda 21 does not exist, I'll prove them wrong. This is a copy. It is a single page. The, the actual printed, it's got an ISBN number and everything. The actual printed copy is a little bit thinner. But uh, this actually is the document. It really, truly does exist, I promise. And uh, uh, the Bio Biodiversity Treaty came out of this, and so did uh, the forests. Uh, it's an Annex 3, and Commission on Sustainable Development. Biodiversity, you know, I haven't even gotten into that too much, but if you want to, if you were really bored sometime, look that up, Biodiversity <laughs> Treaty, and start reading some of that stuff. There are things in there that will make your head just completely, you will not understand where the, how these people think, where they come from, but you'll get a pretty good quick picture of what they want to do. In forests, I put this out here because for forest management, you know there was a long time they had problems with uh, cutting down the forest and the rainforest and all these things, right? Cutting down the trees. Uh, maybe it was a problem, maybe it wasn't. But they absolutely came up with a plan to fix it, whether it was a problem or not, they came up with a plan to fix it. And that plan, and I'm not going to read it all or show it to you all, but 
It actually states in there that government, in one way or another, should have control of the time whether a tree is planted naturally or by man. As it grows, as it's being harvested, they also believe that they should be able to determine how it's being used, what way it's going to be used, and as a matter of fact, they also believe that after that wood product is done being used as a wood product, that they should then be in control of how it's being disposed of, and then finally returning back to the earth. Now, that is, you want to read Forest Annex, uh, you can do that. Um, but uh, here we came up with the Commission on Sustainable Development. These are kind of the uh, uh, sustainable development cops around the world. And uh, we're going to get into the Agenda 21 document now and kind of some of the thought processes. In the uh, preamble, it says Agenda 21 is a comprehensive action plan of action to be taken globally, nationally, and locally, very important, by organizations of the United Nations system, which we are, governments, and major groups in every area in which human impacts on the environment. Can you think of something that you do that does not impact on the environment? No. I can't do that. So what are they talking about? A plan of action on every aspect of the environment, every impact, everything, every way that we impact the environment, they want to come up with a plan of action. The purpose here is that through this preamble, they reaffirm the Declaration of the United Nations Conference on Human Environment. We talked about Stockholm. And they stand seeking to build upon it. So this is where I get into where it's a layer cake. They'll tell you right here in their plannings that they, they know about all these other conferences in the 70s and the 83 conference in Vancouver, the Brooklyn Commission, and they all pile these things on top of each other and they put it into Agenda 21 with the goal of establishing a new and equitable global partnership. There's 27 principles and 40 chapters with 351 pages. Now what do we think about when we think about an equitable global partnership? I was a little naive. I thought equity, equity in a house, right? You got a little bit of money. No, well, no, they don't look at it that way. And as a matter of fact, they look at it a little more this way. This is from my 1967 dictionary that I have. Possessing or exhibiting equity equal in regard to the rights of persons, giving each his due, just, fair, and partial, pertaining to a court of equity, the giving or disposition to give each man his due. So, with the goal of establishing a new and equitable global partnership, what can you start to see that their processes are? We go back and we look at land being shouldn't be held in private property ownership, right? And then you start looking at here with the goal of establishing a new and equitable global park. They believe that the land should all be used for public good, that you should not use it as an individual, and that each everybody in the globe should get their little part of it or something from it. It doesn't mean that each one of the, this equitable global partnership, that doesn't mean we're going to give you a chunk of land and everybody's allowed to have a chunk of land. It just means that any good that comes from that land should be given out equitably, equally across the globe. You know, a lot of these folks believe in America, and if you look at, uh, this is off my topic a little bit, but if you look at, uh, who saw D uh, Dinesh D'Souza's uh, uh, Obama's 20, whatever, 2016, whatever that movie was, if you'll notice how anti-American Obama really is, he doesn't believe in the way that we did a lot of things, primarily because of his father's influences, right? And uh, they believe, a lot of these folks, the leftists and an awful lot of folks from different countries, believe that America has basically raped the world, and that's how we've gotten to be as, as influential and rich as we are. We've gone out, and we've, we've taken over all these other countries, and we've stolen all their resources out of the ground, and, and just raped and pillaged everything, and, and left it all in desolation, and now America is this great shining city on a hill with all these skyscrapers and cars and this affluent, high affluent middle class and so forth. And it's absolutely a load of garbage. You know, I don't know of anything that we've taken from any country that we haven't paid for in one respect or another. So um, uh, it's not our fault that the rest of the world can't figure out what free market capitalism is, but it certainly isn't our fault that we're destroying free market capitalism. Mm -hmm. So we went into equity. Now, how are they going to accomplish this? This is one of the first times that an organization or a group of people have started to put things together. You know, they talk about the environment a little bit sometimes, they'll talk about the economy by itself, and they'll just talk about social justice by itself. Well, this is one of the first times they want to start putting all three of these things together, the environment, the social aspects, and the economy. And if you look at a lot of different websites, you'll, three, you'll see three circles. 
And they're all intertwined, they're interconnected with each other. So we have the environment, the economy, and social aspects of life, and how they all fit together, and this is what they're going to use. With the goal of reducing consumption, they want to control the uh, factors of production, they want to promote social equity, and to do this all, they also require the preservation and restoration of biodiversity. Can somebody give me a quick example of what biodiversity is? Yeah, I didn't really either when I first started looking at it. Their idea of biodiversity is just to make sure that everything that is natural stays as natural as it possibly can. And when we come along and mess with it, we are messing with that biological diversity. And we're, we're destroying habitat and all sorts of different things for other animals. How are they going to do it? They're going to do it through land use regulations, through building codes, wetlands declarations. And this is a very serious problem in... Uh, in uh, Florida, there was also a family out west. Anybody heard about this family? They went out there, they bought a home, and a uh, beautiful place, had some acreage, and uh, I don't know if it rained for a couple of days and a mud puddle stuck around, but they tried to declare that area, or I believe have declared it a wetlands area. They've lost their home, and they they fought it, spent thousands and thousands of dollars, and if, if I remember correctly, they're still not in their home. It's, it's basically done. Uh, so that's how they do it, planning and zoning and master plans. Um, they're going to do it through global education. All media outlets going green. You've heard, heard of the Ad Council. How many times today, if you were driving in your car and listen to the radio, if you listen to talk radio like I did, or maybe even regular radio, how many of you heard today to go out and get to the forests? Oh, yeah. You've heard these commercials about going out and exploring the forest, and these little kids talking about the forest? Well, this is part of their global education program. Uh, population control and reduction. Now this I'm not going to get into very much because it's uh, uh, to be very lengthy. Uh, it makes me very mad. Uh, so we're not going to do a lot, but I highly encourage you to look that up yourself. It's known as the United Nations International Conference on Population and Development. You'll find out that these folks believe that there is only a certain amount of people that should exist in the world. Because the, gov because the planet can't hold but so many people. There's not enough structure Right? Not enough air, clean water, all these different sorts of things for only but a certain amount of people to exist. Um, it, it, it's, it's a little crazy, but it definitely gets into some of the abortion things and all these other different issues and population control. China, the people that believe this way love China. A colleague of mine, Amy Fox, out of Kansas City, has a book. It was a uh, school book that for, for children. And actually inside of it, it says that every time a child is born, the earth groans. <laughs> I'm serious. Well, I'm very serious. This is a book that they were giving to our school children in this particular area. Every time a child is born, the earth groans. So uh, this, is a, this is a very big deal. Uh, now, in America, if you know, um, nothing and no treaty can become law in, in the United States until the Senate votes on it, right? And they have to approve it with how much? Two-thirds? Two-thirds. Majority before it, become a, uh, before it can become an actual treaty. Well, people like Dr. Michael Kaufman, Henry Lamb, and others that have been fighting this for a long time, uh, when the United Nations Agenda 21 came to America, and by the way, like I said, George H.W. Bush did sign it. And do we remember George H.W. Bush? I didn't think about it much of the time, but all these different thousand points of lights. And do you remember when he said, use the actual term, New World Order? Fascinating to me. At the time, I, was, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. His fake, well, we won't talk about that. So anyhow, uh, so in America, uh, a lot of folks got to Congress and they realized, this is junk, guys. We don't want to do this. And the senators and a lot of other elected individuals were, yeah, you're right, we don't want to do this. It never really even got into much uh, in the way of hearings, although it did a little bit. It didn't get a lot of play at the time, and they pulled back. The treaty for Agenda 21 has never been ratified in America, and neither has the Biodiversity Treaty. However, if you start looking at the names of some of these individuals that are involved in the environmentalist movement, you'll find out that they just kind of interweave themselves from the Nature Conservancy, Sierra Club, uh, uh, some of these other groups, uh, Earth First, uh, and they'll, they will intertwine into the Department of the EPA, Department of Natural Resources here in Missouri and other agencies, and they all just kind of flow within all of these different non-government organizations and these bureaucracies. And this is why we're having such a problem with the EPA and some of these other places. 
some good intentioned individuals passed some laws many, many years ago that these staunch environmentalists are now in charge of implementing, and they're now coming up with all these different new rules that they want to stoke on us. Uh, you know, we're about to lose coal production, or at least coal-fired electricity in the state of Missouri. Who is your energy provider now? Is it Amron? Do we yep. like Amron? Maybe, maybe not, doesn't matter. They provide you a service, they provide you electricity. And by the way, in Missouri, they're absolutely 100% control as to how much they can charge you through, through the uh, Public Service Commission, right? So they can't charge you more than what the Public Service Commission says that they can charge you. What do you think is going to happen when we start losing our coal-fired power plants because they go offline? We're going to be out of power. We're going to be out of power, folks. And I'm going to tell you right now, solar and wind is not going to cut it. It's period, not going to cut it. So, um, so we have some problems up there. I got off, got off this just a little bit. but So it didn't get ratified in America, so we come up with the President's Council on Sustainable Development. Our good buddy Bill Clinton, uh, through Executive Order 12852, from 93 to 96, there were 25 members appointed by the President. These were members from uh, GE, other different, uh, um, other different corporations in the United States, as well as various agencies, the EPA, and, and so on and so forth, uh, Park Service and other groups. Uh, those were their members. Uh, J. Gary Lawrence was an advisor to the president at this time. He was also one of these members. And in the end result, they came up with a book called Toward a Sustainable America. Uh, I've got it right here. You can uh, get this off online. You can find that. And if you look that up and download it and start reading it, you're going to start saying, huh. And then when you read it a little bit more and you drive around Cape Girardeau, you're going to say, oh, I see it here. As a matter of fact, if you get into your home and look at the little Energy Star label on the side of your appliances, you'll find it there too. We'll get into that just a little bit more. But this is towards the sustainable America. I got J. Gary Lawrence on here because like I said a little bit ago, I like to look at some of the individuals we're talking about. This is what J. Gary Lawrence said while he was in England talking to sustainable development people there, um, city council folks and other, and other government public officials. He says, in the case of the United States, our local authorities are engaged in planning processes consistent with Local Agenda 21. LA 21 is Local Agenda 21. So he's saying right here, our local authorities are putting into process Agenda 21, right? But there's a little interest in using the LA 21 brand. Participating in a UN advocated process would very likely bring out many of the conspiracy fixated groups and individuals in our society, such as the NRA, citizen militias, and some members of Congress. This segment of our society. Now, he says this segment of society, he's talking about us, not himself or people like him. He says only this segment of our society who fear one world government. Obviously, his segment of society does not fear one world government. And the UN invasion of the United States, through which our individual freedom would be stripped away, would actively work to defeat any elected official who joined the conspiracy by undertaking LA 21. So, we call our process something else, such as comprehensive planning, growth management, or smart growth. Did you know that Cape Girardeau has a comprehensive plan? Yes. Very good. Have you looked at it? <laughs> we'll get into that in just a minute. It is a, uh, I looked on the website, I think it was a 20 year plan. I think their comprehensive plan is. And oh, by the way, uh, Brian was talking earlier about getting involved. I'm trying to pull that up. Um, talking about getting involved, did you know that Cape Girardeau has a board that you could be a part of known as Girardeau Goes Green? Uh, we're a part of it. You're a part of it? We have, <laughs> we got in on that about. Uh, Six months ago? Uh, six or seven months ago, I went to the first meeting, sat in there like a, uh, well, anyway. Good for you. <laughs> I wasn't welcome. She's a member. You're a member of the She is a voting member. She has a vote in on it, and uh, Linda's husband has been again. I will give you more information than you can possibly absorb. Uh, I'll have to get that stuff awesome. to you. So that's fantastic that you're involved in that, because this is where these things start to come into play. Mm -hmm. All right. We didn't know about this stuff until we took our self-governance class, just beautiful, for the record. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So, he's telling you right here that we're implementing Agenda 21 processes in America. We just don't call it that because they know that once you find out what it is, you don't want anything to do with it. So they're going to lie to you and call it smart growth, comprehensive planning, and growth management. So it absolutely is right here in America. 
Part of the uh, uh, President's Council on Sustainable Development, their charter, uh, was to advise the President on domestic implementation of policy options to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This was in 97. The Council should not debate the science of global warming, but should instead focus on the implementation of national local greenhouse gas reduction policies and activities. So in other words, we don't know if global warming is really true or not, but because it might be, let's spend billions of dollars trying to stop it. John Kerry said today, what's the matter if we're wrong on global warming? Well, what does it matter? It's the billions of dollars we're spending that, that yeah. take us down that huge debt that we're in. That's the problem. And it gets even deeper than that. Recommendations and actions. This is, again, on the President's Council on Sustainable Development. Continue to support integration of sustainable development into federal programs. There is not, and I challenge you, there is not a single website or any federal agency, anything to do with the federal government that is not involved in sustainable development. And I would bet you there isn't too many, there aren't too many local governments that are not engaged in sustainable development. Some of it sounds okay. There's nothing wrong with recycling paper, is there? No. There's nothing wrong with recycling aluminum and some plastics and some other things, so long as what? You are the one that chooses to do it. When the government mandates you do it, it's going to cost you money. That's just the way it's going to be. How many trash carriers do you have in Cape Girardeau? Do we know? One trash hauler. Do you know why? This is what's going to happen. It's already happening in a lot of countries, or a lot of cities. And it will happen in Cape Girardeau eventually, if it hasn't already, I don't know. But here's what they do. When you have multiple trash haulers, first you have competition, and you can go out and you can choose who you want to buy your trash service, so on and so forth. Well, when you have multiple trash service like that, it's kind of hard for the government to come along and tell them how to operate things, isn't it? So when you get it down to one in a contract, guess what the government will and has already done in other cities will come along and they'll say, you know what, we think that Cape Girardeau Green, we really need to recycle. And we're going to promote recycling in Cape Girardeau. And there it's such are. a fantastic thing. And a few of you are going to engage. Yeah, it is a smart idea. Maybe it is. Don't take that much to separate trash. Well, that's this year. Well, how about next year when they say, well, this is such a great plan, but you know what? There aren't that many people engaged in it. How about we make it mandatory? Sure, then they'll make it mandatory because it sounds like a great thing, right? When you have one trash hauler, because some of us might think, well, I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'll just throw all of my trash into one bag, and, and they'll never know the difference. Well, guess what? When you have one trash hauler taking all the trash to one spot, they know who you are. <coughs> and not only that, when they start going through your trash, and they find out that you are not participating in the recycling program, guess what? You're going to be fined. As a matter of fact, down in Dallas, Car Carrollton, Texas, excuse me, where my mother-in-law was from, a $250 fine was levied for putting a loading can in a regular trash bag. Oh. Mm -hmm. We have two trash sure cans in Cape. I'm sorry? We have two trash cans in Cape. Two trash, trash cans in Cape. <clears throat> so it's already here. Are, can you be fined if you mix it up? Uh, at this point, they, they just won't pick it up if they see it's mixed. Okay. That's coming. The fine is coming. Unless you stop it, the fine is coming. So, okay. Uh, that's, that's why we do some of those things. So city governments, federal governments are all involved in this. Uh, they overcome... <laughs> this is another, uh, uh, another recommended action. Overcome legal, fiscal, and policy barriers and impediments for the implementation of these processes. How do you think they're going to do that? Well, here's what they do. If they can't change it by executive order or through some sort of legislation,